intellectually accomplished guy. Um, and uh, through getting to know him, uh, I started to be exposed a little bit more to what he does, um, you know, helping athletes perform at their peak. And I, you know, I've read probably, uh, you know, dozen of sports psychology books out there. And I don't want this to sound the wrong way, but I was never, never a fan of, of them. Um, I always felt like they were as a, as a numbers person, I always felt like they were, you know, lacking in a lot of the detail that I would have wanted to understand. Um, and I would want to know a little bit more of the, you know, what's going on, why is it going on? What can I do about it? Why do those things work? Um, instead of just, you know, they, they control your emotions, you know, let it go, forget about it. <laughs> You know, some of the basic stuff, and I don't mean to trivialize what anyone's put out there, and I don't want it to sound the wrong way, but I always walked away from those books going, I'm not really sure exactly precisely what you want me to do. And so when I learned a little bit more about what Dr. Justice does, he has a certification program uh, for coaches to go through. And I'm, you know, I, I didn't walk out of that with a PhD in neuroscience by any stretch. But I walked out of that with a really good understanding of how our brain is working from a neuroscience perspective and what's going on when we get anxious, nervous, upset, mad, angry, disappointed, frustrated, you know, pick the word, what's going on, why that's happening, what it impacts, and then what you can do about it. And so of all the things that I've worked with, with players, I, I give them you know, what I've learned, I'm regurgitating what I've learned from him through his process. That is the thing that they've all told me has been probably the most effective. Um, so that, that's the number one thing. It's a really cool area. And, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a conversation I always enjoy having with players. What's an example of that? Like something like there's a, you know, what would the movie trailer kind of look like for that course or that? Can you give me an example where, you know, Tony just snap hooks, you know, two balls in a row off the TOB and, and he's, he's a little frustrated with himself. And what would you, you know, what might you say to him? What could you say? Hey, I want to sit down and work with you for 30 seconds. Here's something I could. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. So I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to give you the two minute view of that. Um, it's a little bit more than two minutes. It's not much more. But it's a little bit more than two minutes. Um, basically, your brain is a big ball of electricity, right? And your ability to hit a golf shot exists in your brain. It does not exist in your muscles. There's no such thing as muscle memory. The muscles have no ability to retain or store information. The muscles are executing the instructions that the brain is providing to them. And so because your brain is a big ball of electricity, there's frequencies. There's high frequency, low frequency. High frequency, think of it like uh, a seismograph, right? You know, when there's an earthquake going on, it looks like this. Um, low frequency, there's no earthquake. It's just kind of flat line. There's nothing there. I know that one really well. Yeah. And so what happens when you get to high frequency, when you get mad, angry, upset, anxious, nervous, scared, what happens when you get to high frequency is it does a couple of things. Um, it impacts your ability to deliver those instru instructions effectively. Um, and first thing that it does is it, it messes up the sequencing potentially of those instructions and, and how they get delivered. And so we think of as golfers, we think of sequencing in terms of golf, you know, sequencing of, uh, of our, of our swing and the kinetic sequence. If you're familiar with, with, uh, what that is, well, these instructions that are going from your brain to your muscles have to go and get executed and fire your muscles in a certain order. And when you get to high frequency, um, those instructions, which are traveling down neural pathways, think of those like roads that are going throughout your body. Um, those instructions, when you're in high frequency, they're going to run into traffic. They're get, there's a lot of traffic on those roads. And so let's say, and this is oversimplifying, let's say the bit of information that needs to get to your left wrist so that at impact, your left wrist is one degree of flexion at impact. It gets there a little bit late because there's a huge traffic jam, you know, in your left arm. Um, and it's at one degree of extension at impact because it got be like, next time. Yep. Right. Big jam in my well, it's time. not an excuse. It's true. That's, that's what's going on. And so if it gets there a little bit late, you're not going to be in one degree of flexion one and that throws the face way off and you hit a bad shot. So when you see golfers on TV that get into really high stress situations and their swings start to look funky, that is a contributing factor. 
the instructions are showing up out of order, out of sequence. Things are happening out of order, out of sequence, which is why their swing looks funny. The second thing that it does when you get into high frequency is it impacts your ability to feel force. So feeling force would be, if you've ever gotten nervous um, and your arms start to feel heavy, your hands right. start to feel heavy, like that is your brain having a, a tough time um, feeling force. And so how that translates to golf, I'm, I'm sure you both both have done this. Um, you're, you have a wedge in your hand. It's a perfect number for that wedge. There's no wind. It's flat. No, you're not uphill or downhill. You hit it exactly how you want on the button, flight it exactly how you want. And as soon as it leaves the club, you're like, be close, like get in the hole. Like, and, and it drops out of the sky 25 yards short, or it goes 25 <laughs> yards long. And you're like, I have no idea. You, it's one of those where you legitimately like, I have no idea what just happened. What just happened? Well, if you are at all high frequency, your ability to feel force can, can be impacted. So let's say you typically swing your wedge 80 miles per hour. Uh, you may have swung at 85. You may have swung at 75. It felt to you like it was exactly 80 because your force is off a little bit. Um, putting also happens in putting when you get into high stress situations. You'll see a player in a high stress, high stress situation with a 25 footer and they hit it 12 feet by or they leave it eight feet short. And they're like, what just happened? Your ability to feel force gets impacted. And the last thing that it does when you get to high frequency, when, when those roads get uh, clogged up with traffic, the last thing that it does is it impacts your ability to hold a target. Uh, so golf is very different than most every other sport in that you're not typically looking at the target in golf, uh, unless it's a close putt or if you happen to be a heads up putter. Other than that, you take one last look. And then you're looking down. As soon as you look down, your brain has to have the ability to hold that target. Um, it's kind of like um, shooting free throws with your eyes closed, right? You step up, you dribble a few times, you look up, you close your eyes. You have to remember where that is. Well, that gets a lot tougher when you get to high frequency. So when you see players in high pressure situations that hit these, you know, maybe a big block or a big pull, a contributing factor to that can be that they lost where the target was. They looked down and their brain shifted the target seven, eight, nine, ten 10 yards right. And all that's happening is their body is reacting to where that target, to, to where it now thinks the target is, which is why they hit some of those shots. So that was probably more than two minutes, but that's in a nutshell what's going on. And the entire objective of, uh, you know, trying to, tackle the mental game when you're, when you're golfing is getting to low frequency and staying at low frequency. That's the entire objective. Low frequency is where you're going to find the zone. If you ask any player that's ever been in the, have you ever been in the zone playing golf, playing any sport? Has it sure. ever happened? Yeah, like absolutely. Twice. Like twice. What did it feel like? It felt like nothing. It felt like nothing. Like it was just total control. Like, like cruise control. Yeah. What else? Um, slow. Such a common. That's like such it. a common answer. It felt really slow. I was in control. It was easy. You know, that was unconscious. Well, that's when you're in low frequency, you have alpha and theta brain waves. That, that's predominantly what it will be. And that feeling um, is what you will get when you have alpha and theta brain waves. And so the entire objective of the mental game is, is trying to get to that state. Now, that this does not guarantee you're going to hit a good shot. It just kind of tips the scales in your favor. And when you're high frequency, that doesn't guarantee you're going to hit a bad shot. It just kind of tips the scales that way. Um, so the entire objective is to try to stay low frequency. There's a lot of different things you can do, but that's when I first learned this and first was exposed to this, um, and I'm going through it really, really fast. Um, it For the first time, the light bulb clicked and I was like, okay, I get it now. That's what's going on. That's what's going to happen. Here's what you can do about it. And here's why those things work. And the answer to why those things work is because they lower your brainwave frequency, which is the entire objective of what we're trying to do. So how do you, I mean, this is, this is fascinating. We've gone down. Ah, a little this bit is really rabbit cool. Hole here, but yeah. This is, I got uh, how do you, how do you clear the traffic jet? Like, um, so there's a lot of things you can do. So, uh, you're breathing, like um, you breathe in your pre-shot pre routine, right? You take a deep breath. Why do you do that? 
call them. Those Everybody does. I don't know that I do. I don't think <laughs> well, that's uh, <laughs> most people do. Most people take some kind of deep breath. Well, if we had you hooked up to an EEG machine to measure your brainwave frequency, um, and you took a deep breath, you would see your brainwave frequencies start to come down. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. And you can, uh, you know, you can magnify that through some other techniques that probably, I won't share those publicly. I'll tell you guys after. Um, but, you know, just taking a deep breath, a really slow, controlled deep breath is going to lower your brainwave frequency. Focusing on something really intently is going to lower your brainwave frequency. So right now I'm looking at a web camera that's right in front of me. Yeah, or, you know, I'll go right over here. I have a picture. I have a whiteboard that's over here on my wall right behind. And there's two different kinds of focus. There's macro focus and micro focus. And macro focus is just, you know, I'm just kind of noticing things around me. So all I'm doing is looking at detail and then finding details and more details and details about the details. And simply by doing that, going through that exercise, I'm lowering brainwave frequency. So if you're walking down the fairway and you, you know, you, you're, you can look up at the clouds and macro focus would be, oh, there's a bunch of clouds in the sky. Micro focus would be, Hey, there's a cloud. Oh, look at that one. It looks like Snoopy. Uh, and that one, you know, looks like, you know, it looks like my car. It looks like the first car I had when, when I was a kid. Look at that. Oh, there's like an exhaust coming out and you're finding all these details about the clouds or you're looking at a tree and you're looking at a specific part of the tree and maybe a branch and then focusing in on some twigs and some leaves and simply the act of doing those things is going to lower your brainwave frequency. Uh, and you can do that through all of your senses. So by really engaging all of your senses, you can um, lower your brainwave frequency. So if you were to take a drink of Gatorade, um, instead of just taking a drink of Gatorade, what you could do is take a drink of Gatorade, put it in your mouth, kind of swish it around a little bit like you are a, a wine taster, a, a sommelier, and, and notice all the hints of, you know, your blue, your, your blue Gatorade. <laughs> you know, I, I, I notice blue. blue. Raspberry. Yeah. Oh, there's some <laughs> aftertaste. Um, yeah, there's a chemical. Um, but noticing that and noticing the texture and the temperature and how the temperature feels and how it changes as it's in your mouth, all of that and focusing on that is going to accomplish our primary objective, which is lowering your brainwave frequency. That's the goal of all of this is to lower brainwave frequency. So again, I'm going through this so fast and, and, and relatively high level, but that's kind of the gist of it. And, and that part has been fascinating to me and to